the power of giving one hour. If you'll give us 30 minutes, you'll find out what it's all about. Coming up next on Carolina People. Good morning. Welcome to Carolina People. This morning we're at the Myrtle Beach Herald. We're focused on the Waccamaw Community Foundation and we're visiting with its president, Jonathan Creskin. Good morning, Jonathan. Good morning. Pleasure to meet you. Thanks so much for coming in. Thanks for having me. This is so exciting to think about the, the Y'all's Foundation, the Waccamaw Community Foundation, and all that's going on right now with the big trust that's kicked off recently and so many activities of y'all uh, really wrapping around the community. We're uh, really doing our best to uh, get involved in the community. Although we've been here approximately five years, we're really making a big push this year with our new uh, program, the Walk Mall Community Trust, to get the word out about the Community Foundation. And we thank you for letting us be here. Absolutely. I think it was Paulette Best and the folks who's the new uh, president of CAMP, the Coastal Correct. Advertising Marketing Professionals, who has picked the Walk Mall Community Foundation as its charity of choice for the year to really focus on to try to help make sure so many amazing community groups to focus on and to take the time to single one out. It's a tough thing to do, obviously, but to know that this uh, locally funded and founded uh, foundation will really make a difference is a smart call. It is, and we really want to thank CAMP for uh, selecting us as their for the uh, campaign this year, because without CAMP, there's we could never have gotten done what we are hoping to get done this year, which is launching this new campaign. And with launching the new campaign, the hope and the goal would be to also get the awareness out about the community foundation itself. Right. And this partnership with the Sun News, which is a tremendous one, and all the folks over there, Knight Ritter, the uh, Knight Foundation, really makes a commitment, and the Sun News, the daily newspaper in the area, is tremendous. It is. With, uh, the community foundation is very involved with the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, which right. obviously most people associate with the Sun News oh, yeah. and Knight Ritter. And without the Knight Foundation, the community foundation really wouldn't be here. They have uh, supported us not only with their time and their talents, but also with financial resources to help us really get the community foundation started. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I remember when David Bishop and others were making those early calls. Golly, what, five? You say five, five years, years ago? ago? It seems like it was longer than that. Uh, in the late 90s that he well, was beginning that uh, that mission. Well, actually, it was a little bit longer than that. We actually were incorporated in 99, but thanks to people like David Bishop and Jimmy Johnson right. and the founding board members, it was really because of their love for the community that they thought we needed a community foundation mm -hmm. to tie everything together and to help the nonprofit organizations. And David Bishop really took this community foundation to the next level. And I obviously replaced uh, David Bishop. Is that right? Two tough years ago. Steps, uh, tough shoes to follow, tough, Jonathan. Very tough shoes to fill. Absolutely. But David's been gracious and helpful all throughout the process of the transition and continues to be actively involved in the Community Foundation. He remains on the board. He does. Great. And How exciting. Serves several of the committees. Okay, good. Real quick about yourself, Jonathan. Are you originally from the area? Well, I'm I say originally from the area, as most people say. I was actually born in Virginia, but my father and mother moved here to Horry County in 1974. Wow, so you're a local. I consider myself a local. <laughs> That's huge. 19 and, and so, of course, you, you spent time here. I think I saw you were the Coastal Academy. I did. I grew up here, went to grade school here, attended St. Andrews School. Then after St. Andrews Catholic School, I went to Coastal Academy and graduated from Coastal Academy in 1983. Okay, okay. For our viewers in the PD in southeastern North Carolina who may not be familiar with Coastal Academy, is it still around? Going Coastal strong? Academy is no longer around. It was a private high school at that time and is no longer in existence here. And I'm not sure when it disbanded, Greg, but I think it was somewhere in, in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh -huh. I think it was late 80s that Coastal right. Academy disband. Okay. You went on down to the Citadel. I did. I what, went in what 19... prompted that move? Um, uh, several coaches at my high school, several of my colleagues, and actually several of the uh, alumni from the Citadel always, since I was a young boy, I just looked up to the alumni here in Myrtle Beach Is and right? wanted to always go to the Citadel ever since I could remember. What was that first year like at the Citadel, John? As everyone will tell you, it's a little bit tough. It's obviously a lot different than attending, you know, USC or Clemson. Right. Uh, but um, as a whole, it was well worth it. Mm -hmm. It was a tough year, but with your classmates and the alumni program that's there to support you, it's not quite as tough to get through. Mm -hmm. That must have been exciting, of course, to be down there for four years and still be close enough to home. Do you still have family here in the area? I do. My mom and dad actually still live here. My father was... Um, was uh, Pastor Albert S. Kreskin, and he ran Risen Christ Lutheran Church. 
and I live in Briarcliff Acres, so I live across the street from where my where I, my father worked. And actually, the nice part is I'm living in my mom and dad's house, the oh, house that on. I grew up in. So I'm raising my two boys, Albert and John Morgan, and my, I live there with my wife, Catherine, and I'm living in the same house that my mom and dad raised myself and my brother and sister in. How exciting. Were your brother and sister stayed in the area as well? My brother, here, my brother Todd Crespin, works for Burrs and Chapin, right. and my sister actually lives in Washington, D.C. and works for the Red Cross. Is that right? We all went to school here locally. That's fascinating. Just yesterday, Mel Tiller was with us uh, with the Red Cross promoting their, their Heroes campaign and a big event they have coming up on July 9th. The Red Cross is really out in the community. They do, and we do a lot of work with the Red Cross. Uh, we're trying to get more people to support the Red Cross through funds at the Community Foundation, but I work well with the new director, Angela, and sure. also work well with Jennifer. Absolutely. Jennifer Sweat and Angela yes. was formerly at the Sun News as their neighbor's editor. Just right. Cracker Jack has a lot of great to print experience, so that should be a great partnership. And we have, we have actually met several times now. We're working on several programs, trying to work more with the disaster relief programs that we're hopeful to put in place where we can collaborate together and use the resources of the Community Foundation as well as the resources of the Red Cross right. in case of a natural disaster that we can help the community. Absolutely. Golly, we sure want to get more into foundations. But again, real quick, you, after leaving the Citadel, did I see you went, uh, went to law school? I did. I attended uh, the University of Richmond, which is called the T.C. Williams School of Law. Um, as you said earlier, I had been close to home. And actually, growing up here, going to the Citadel was close to home. And I had never been much further out of Horry County or Charleston <laughs> County and decided instead of going to USC to go to Columbia to go to law school, I'd go somewhere else. Several of my professors suggested I look at the University of Richmond. Oh, when yeah. I went up to the University of Richmond, I fell in love with the campus oh, yeah. and was accepted to law school there and realized it was only about five and a half hours away from home and attended the University of Richmond and graduated in 1990. Is that right? Yeah. Golly, how exciting. Of course, the University of Richmond was real famous for, it may have been a decade ago, hosting the, the retrial of Harvey Mudd and F. Lee Bailey was yes. brought in. There was a lot. Walter Cox, real famous name from Charleston. Uh, former uh, chief judge of the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces and many others Correct. up there for that big deal. University of Richmond Law School is a superstar. It is, and such a great location being there with the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. Oh, yeah, right. that's right, Richmond. What a great location. Then I think I saw you went to the JAG Corps. I did. After I attended, after I graduated from law school, I spent four years in the JAG Corps, and I worked in the Medical Service Corps. I was actually attached to, I lived in Fort Carson, Colorado, right. and then after that, my wife and I lived in Denver, Colorado, for four, almost right at four years. Um, and I was a part of the Medical Service Corps, and I ran the Fitzsimmons Army Medical Center in Denver, Colorado. Wow, that must have been exciting. You mean the legal exciting. side or actually the legal running? Side. Okay. Yeah. I was there with three other JAG officers. We had a colonel, and I was a captain at the time. We had two captains, so there was only three of us at Fitzsimmons. It was a small Army facility. Yeah. We were actually attached to the Fort, Fourth ID, which is Fort Carson, which was about 60 miles south in, in Colorado Springs. Right. For viewers who may not be familiar right. with JAG officers, is it like the TV show, John? Well, it depends. My, my job wasn't quite that exciting, <laughs> being in the Medical Service Corps, but you do get to do some fun things. We got to fly around in helicopters and do really? all kind of interesting things, and we did the Army lifestyle. Right. But a lot of what we did is we were attorneys. We were attorneys for the JAG, for the officers and the company commanders, and mm -hmm. I was attached. I had three or four company commanders, and I worked for them. Is that right? You know, another Citadel alum, Dick Richard Foltz, was with us recently talking about service in the JAG Corps. Of course, his son, who just arrived, I think had just completed his uh, four years at the Citadel and excitement for a dad, probably like your excitement. Now, as you see your boys and think, hey, guys, you may want to think about the Citadel. I mean, it must be a, it's a big deal getting the JAG Corps. And you're all looking at all the little particulars of, of military life and making sure they still abide by the military laws. Yeah. I think the military, you know, not only did I attend four years at the Citadel, but I spent four years in the military. And I do believe, I honestly believe that that's such a good background for somebody. The mm -hmm. ethics, the integrity that they instill, not only at the Citadel, but in the armed forces is a wonderful mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. Boy, Jonathan, what was it about Colorado that just wasn't enough to keep you there? What was it about Horry County that brought you back? Family. Is that right? To be flat out honest, Colorado was one of the most beautiful places I oh, ever yeah, lived. Yeah, sure. But as some people say, and I think it's really true, you get a little sand in your shoes and it's hard to leave. My mm -hmm. mom and dad, my sister was actually living in Charlotte at the time, mm -hmm. so she was close by. My wife is from Greensboro, North Carolina. Right. And so it was really hard once we started having children. My actual youngest, my oldest son, John Morgan, was born in Colorado. Right. But when he was six or seven months old is when we came back to Horry County. 
and uh, it really was a tough call. If we didn't have the family ties that we had here in Horry County, yeah. it, my wife and I were really contemplating staying in Colorado. And Greensboro wasn't, uh, your uh, wife's uh, family didn't say, you've got to come back to Greensboro. That must have been a tug of war It there. was tough. I think yeah. she, we really looked, at, we'd, at one point we looked at Greensboro. Yeah. I interviewed with some jobs and some law firms in Greenville, sure. actually, I mean Greensboro, and started to think about that. But in reality, I really knew I wanted to be home back to Myrtle Beach. Oh, yeah. And Greensboro is a straight shot down 220. I mean, you're right here. It is. It's wonderful. Yeah. And it's wonderful. Uh, the nice part, and I guess my wife and I consider ourselves so lucky, is both my mom and dad are still living, and my wife's parents are both still living. So Great. our children have a wonderful relationship with both sets of grandparents. Oh, yeah. How exciting. So, Built-in yeah. babysitters. Yes, that's right. That probably you take advantage of your brother some, too. I do. Too. I yeah. take advantage of my brother. And my mom and dad recently relocated when they uh, allowed my wife and I to move into their home. They built in the new Barefoot Resort area. Oh, great. And so yeah. they're kind of across the street. So we do right. have built-in babysitters that's there. That's right. That must be great. It is. And of course, uh, you now is your dad still involved with Risen Christ? Or he, well, Church? he retired back in 1996, okay. and he also still teaches at Webster University. He right. he has his PhD and got and counts is a counselor, and he teaches the counselor program at Webster University here. Tremendous! Local. I think I saw you're also doing some paralegal training at Ori Georgetown Tech. I do. I work with Donna McQueen. She allows me to teach on a part-time basis. I teach at night, uh, just one course, probably maybe one to two a year. Um, so it doesn't take away from the foundation work, but it allows me to keep involved with the community as well as with the legal profession. Oh, absolutely. And I really enjoy that. So when you came down here from uh, Colorado, you, you got into the practice of law here. I did. Where did you practice? I practiced uh, in the Stevens Law Firm in Loris. Oh, great, in Loris. I was in Loris for almost six years with Jimmy Stevens. Wow. Wonderful yeah. experience. Jimmy was a great trial lawyer. And, of course, his father, who recently passed away, was Senator James P. Right. Stevens. Of course. So the law firm was just a wonderful law firm and had great experience. And Jimmy really helped me with my trial work. And you went straight from the Stevens Law Firm into the Waccamaw Community Foundation? I did not. I went from the Stevens Law Firm into the Wheelis McGinnis Law Firm in North Myrtle Beach. Oh, wow. So I practiced uh, in Loris for several years and then about, I guess it was close to three years in North Myrtle Beach with the Wheelis McGinnis Law Firm. Right. I worked with the, my partners were Albert Wheelis, Cliff Welsh, and Luke Hughes. And the mm -hmm. three of us had a partnership on, in North Myrtle Beach on Main Street. And I did that for until October 15th of 03 right. yeah. when, I took the, when I took over uh, David Bishop's position at the Community Foundation. And you said, Mom and Dad, get out of the house. We're moving <laughs> in. Go over to Barefoot. Get a nice place so our children can come visit. Yeah. Well, it was sort of like that. But in reality, my mom and dad knew that we needed to upsize with two growing children. Oh, and they yeah. wanted to downsize. So it was just a great, a great mix for our family. Yeah, that must have been. Waccamaw Community Foundation, you said 1999, incorporated, Correct. obviously getting rolling. I'm sure they've been thinking about it for a, a number of years even before that. Some right. of the folks, you said Jimmy Johnson and David Bishop and so many others, obviously, have had their hand in that to really make it happen. What exactly is a community foundation, and how does that differ from, let's say, the United Way, you know, which obviously, much like a foundation, is spreading their funds around? Well, first of all, a little bit of the history about the community foundation, Greg, is there are 650 community foundations nationwide. Wow. And I don't think a lot of people realize that. There happen to be eight community foundations in South Carolina. The Waccamaw Community Foundation is one of those. The nice part about community foundations is we share a lot of information. We're, we work with one another. We help each other out. And when I came on board, the eight other community foundations that are local, there's Charleston, Hilton Head, Spartanburg, Greens, Greenville, and Columbia. Right. And we all work together. And they help each other out. That was a great, great resource for, for me to learn as a new person with the community foundation field in the nonprofit world was to work with those other community foundations. Sure. But I think some people really are saying, what is a community foundation? A community foundation is basically a tax-exempt public charity, just like any other nonprofit organizations. But what a community foundation does is we are not just a nonprofit organization like any other nonprofit, but we work with all the nonprofit organizations in our area, and that is Ori and Georgetown County. Mm -hmm. And we service those nonprofit organizations. And a community foundation does basically, well, I like to think it has different tiers, but it has two. That is, we work with the donors. We mm -hmm. help our donors almost as a vehicle for their giving. Right. We try to work with our donors to help them work with their ideas and their endeavors. We may sit down with the, their local attorney, their local CPA, mm -hmm. and then we work with them to help them set up their goals. We find out what the donors want to support, what their causes are. An example might be where a donor wants to set up a, an endowed fund to support, as we were talking about right. earlier, the Red Cross. Right. 
they may truly love the Red Cross and want to see that in the future. We can set up an endowed fund or a non-endowed fund at our community foundation in their name forever that will always support the Red Cross. Right. And we also, we make grants out of the funds that we have at our community foundation, either are direct gifts from people, unrestricted gifts to the community foundation, or other sources where we receive funding, we make grants back out to all the community foundations. Mm -hmm. I mean, excuse me, all the nonprofit, nonprofit organizations in right, town. Right. And we only service Ori and Georgetown County. So all the grants that the Waccamaw Community Foundation makes are only in Ori and Georgetown County. Now, don't get confused because a donor can actually make a grant from their fund outside of Ori and Georgetown County. Right, right. Now, some of the difference between, let's, let's say, why would I want to make a, a donation to the Rock and Community Foundation rather than United Way, which I assume has a similar premise. What are the prime differences Yeah, there? I think a lot of people, and that's a common question that I get asked all the time, is the difference between the United Way and a community foundation. Right. And I like to think of it in these terms. And, and I work very closely with Olivia Guerin at the United Way, sure. and we do support the United Way, and they actually help support us in different causes because right. we both work with the nonprofit organizations. Right. But one thing that we like to think about a community foundation is we are the savings account for Ori and Georgetown County, different than the United Way. An example would be when United Way has their big an annual campaign and they raise whatever funds that may be, right. say a million dollars, they then spend that million dollars out immediately and support the causes that you and I and everybody else in Horry County care about. Sure. What difference in a community foundation is we try to establish permanent funds. Mm -hmm. We want to have endowed permanent funds so we support those causes you care about in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. What I mean by that is forever. Mm -hmm. what, if you were to establish a fund for a, a nonprofit organization in town or then what would happen is you would put X number of dollars in that fund and for the rest of your life and the rest of everyone else's life for perpetuity, right. we would derive 5% of that fund would go to that cause you care about. Great. Wow. It's a great place for people to leave a legacy, a memorial for somebody. We do other things too, which is kind of neat. We do scholarship funds. Great. We, have so many, we don't have so many, but we have several good scholarship funds now that have been established by local citizens. They place an, a certain amount of money with the community foundation to create an endowed fund say it in their family name. Mm -hmm. And then that family then will get scholarships. We have one right now. We have the John Drawn Scholarship where he supports a student from North North Beach attending Coastal Carolina. Great. We have one for the old city attorney. I don't know if you remember Alan Bloom. He used to be the city attorney mm -hmm. in Myrtle Beach. Sure, a Marion native. Right. Alan's family came to us um, several years after Alan died, and their family has steadily been putting money into a fund, and they give a scholarship to a Conway student to attend USC every year. Great. So it's a wonderful way to leave a legacy, memorialize a family member. That is. That is a dramatic difference. I'm sure a lot of folks hadn't thought about that. And, of course, I think I saw in visiting y'all's website that there is a tie to the other seven or eight uh, community foundations throughout the state. There are there some are. common themes that y'all make sure that everyone knows about. Of course, everyone heard about the, uh, the big, the big uh, estate gift, the Brunel Foundation, or otherwise the woman who had passed away mm -hmm. and gave that, I believe, much of that to a community foundation to oversee the distribution through did. primarily Georgetown County, I believe. And, and the nice part about that was um, Mrs. Baruch took the time to look at all the different resources that she had, but knowing that a community foundation could really oversee and make sure her wishes were carried out. Right. The nice part about that is, because some people ask this question all the time, they'll say, well, why should I give money through the community foundation if I'm just going to get, why shouldn't I just give that money directly to either, say, the United Way or the Red Cross sure. or the Animal Shelter, whichever they care about. The nice part is you can give through a community foundation. And by giving through a community foundation, if you set up an endowed fund or a fund that you ask the board to administer or oversee, is we kind of keep due diligence. We keep the tabs on that. So mm -hmm. you could put restrictions on it. And for example, as long as the nonprofit organization is continuing to do what they chartered to do, in other words, take care of the homeless or feed right. the healthy animals mm -hmm. or take care of cats, whatever it may be, we can support that. So you can kind of put some checks and balances on that and say, we'd like to give X percent every year as long as they're doing that. Right. So it kind of gives the donor peace of mind, even when they're gone, that their money is doing what they wanted it to do for the community. Mm, that's wonderful. Absolutely. It's that a, does make a difference. Right. Because oftentimes after you're gone or and your family's concerned about the way mom or dad uh, in, invested something and the group right. may not be doing what they used to be doing, Correct. there's really no way to touch or to, to change that around. Right. We've had several donors create funds, um, which is kind of nice. And, and what we're really trying to do, and innate idea is it's family philanthropy. 
We've had several donors create funds, and what they do is they create an endowed fund or even a non-endowed fund where they can spend the income in principle. Right. But once they put that money there, the money stays with the foundation, and they let us know what causes they want to support. But the nice part is when mom and dad are gone, they've named their children as the successor advisors to this fund. Right. So it brings the children involved and oh, helps yeah. them stay involved in philanthropy in our community, knowing that those children are going to have the ability to be able to give to the causes that they truly care about. That is fantastic, Jonathan. A great way to get family involved. It is. Speaking of family, the Horry County, Horry Georgetown County family, and I guess a little bit of the Brunswick County family, right. much served by the, the Sun News, and you all have teamed together in this Waccamaw Community Trust. Right. Share with the folks about what you and the Sun News got together on to make happen here. This is a wonderful and exciting time for the Community Foundation. We have launched a new program called the 2005 Waccamaw Community Trust. Right. And with the gracious help of the Sun News and, of course, the, the Knight Foundation, oh, yeah. we have two opportunities. The Sun News has agreed to give us a lot of coverage with this, is what we felt we needed to get the word out about oh, the community, yeah. tr about the Waccamaw Community Trust. And what the Community Trust is, is this. It's a fund at the Community Foundation. Our goal is to raise a million dollars right. and put this fund in there. But the nice part about this fund is once we reach our goal at the end of 2005, we're going to select 15 individuals who ever donated to our fund right. to serve as the advisors of that fund. Wow. So we want to bring the community in and let them tell us what they think the focus is. Right. An example of this would be if we were to reach our goal of a million dollars, that fund would turn out about $50,000 a year. An endowment. An endowment. Right. It's going to be a permanent endowment fund that will stay there. And every year, that endowment fund would, would actually pay out approximately $50,000 per year. And the nice part is every year we're going to select a different 15 individuals to work with our board to be able to make those grants and determine what the focus is for that year in our community. That is fantastic. It Great is. thinking. And How did you all come up with that idea? Well, we actually, several of our board members looked at this idea, and there was two other community foundations in the Colorado area who did one of these back in 1999. They did a Millennium Trust. Right. And they did something similar to it, but not quite as a little bit different. We have our own little twist. We've added some more people to the advisory committee and we've done a little bit different. We're going to try to have this fund every year so we can continue to grow this fund. Sure. And one thing that I, ha I forgot to mention was the Knight Foundation has offered us a challenge grant. Oh yeah. If we can raise $600,000, the Knight Foundation will give us $300,000. Wow. Yeah. So they're going to give us a two-for-one match. And so that's the real push right now is to get to that $600,000 mark. Right. Therefore, the Knight Foundation will contribute $300,000 to this trust fund. That is fantastic. The Knight Foundation, this is the group that owns the Sun, or the, uh, the Sun of the Founders, Knight Ritter. Knight Foundation, John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, I've learned a lot about the Knight Foundation. They originally owned all the Knight Ritter newspapers. Right. But when those brothers actually passed away, they took all their stock and they entered into a foundation. Great. And what, that, what they do with the Knight Foundation is they support the 26 communities who have newspapers in their area. Sure. Luckily, Horry County has the Sun News, oh, therefore yeah. we get a lot of support from the Knight Foundation. That is great, they Jonathan. Do. What a great partnership. It is. It's a wonderful partnership. And again, they also help us with the grants that we make out into the community. You know, when we think about uh, so, oftentimes, and I think I saw on your website, one of the frequently asked questions are, aren't foundations just for the wealthy? I think you've laid out all the reasons why they're not. One of the great things in a press release that went out highlighted that if folks just donated their hours worth of time, yep. if it's a, a child's 50 cent uh, a portion, uh, an hour of their lunch money or otherwise, it was a great idea there. How did you right. all come up with that idea? Actually, our board member came up with, the, with this, one of our board members, Mr. Mike Gerald, right. uh, the chairman of our board, came up with the slogan, and it is the power of giving one hour. And just like you said, the goal of, the, of this is to let people know in our community that the community foundation is not just for the wealthy. Right. If the, we realize what we can do with this community foundation and this new 2005 Waccamaw Community Trust by leveraging resources, in other words, just like you said, if we can get the babysitter to donate 50 cents of her dollar, that's just as important as the businessmen donating their hour or the retired people in our community, which we have so many retirees to give a portion of their income. If we can all leverage that and create one large fund, think of what will happen in the years to come. There's $50,000 that will be here forever, right. and our community activists will be involved in telling us what that focus is. That is critical, Jonathan. I'm yes. sure you've been out selling the story, really pumping up the Guacamole Community Trust as well as the foundation. Yes. If you had a minute to kind of sum up what's a real focus now, obviously with the, the camp promotion and so many other folks making it happen, what's, what would you do in a minute? 
Well, I think in a minute I would really say that we'd like to see people support the, walk, the 2005 Waccamaw Community Trust. I believe that the Waccamaw Community Trust, as we've said before, is really a way to bring in the whole community to realizing what we can do and the needs that we have in our community and how the whole community can pull together, be it with a small donation or a large donation, we can all come together and create a large fund that will support the community forever. Great. The best number for someone to call? The best number for someone to call for the Community Foundation is 916-GIVE, and of course that's 4483. Great. Jonathan, thanks so much for being Thank with us. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. it Absolutely. A pleasure. Thank Very you. Very definitely. Stay tuned to more Carolina People with Jonathan Creskin coming up next. I got to say that phone number, I'll forget it, 843-916-GIVE, 916-4483 or the website, wacomallcf.org. Take the time to write it down, 843-916-GIVE. You know, you heard my, Jonathan talk about exactly what Mike Gerald said, the power of one hour, giving one hour of your time. Think about that. The six-year-old who's given his 50-cent allowance, the part-timer who's given their 515 hourly wage there, the executive who's given a $100 check, or that business owner who may take the time, the local business owner, to write a $1,000 check the power of giving one hour, the power of giving one hour. 843-916-GIVE, it's so critical. You know, when you think about Jonathan's time, the four years at the Citadel, the three years up in Richmond, the four years in Colorado, something about Horry County was pulling him back. In the same sense, that executive board getting together, the executive committee thinking about what are we going to do and the partnership with the Sun News, the Waccamaw Community Foundation thinking, how are we going to do it right? This is not a novel idea. You heard him talk about it. Somewhere else they've thought about this, but it's a real idea that's going to make a difference in the community. On a constant basis, there was something about Horry County pulling him back. You know, was it his parents? Obviously. Was it his, the opportunity for his children to be with his grandparents and his wife's parents up in Greensboro? The experiences are here. This is a strong community. It's a gigantic county. There's lots of places you could put your money. Take the time to give them a call at 916-GIVE to learn more about the Waccamaw Community Foundation and this new trust they've kicked off with the Sun News. It'll be worth your time. 